makeup would be about this thick across the skin. It, you just were not yourself underneath. Now makeup allows your true skin to shine through so that it's not a cover up like a mask. It is giving you great coverage, but it's lighter. It sets on top of the skin. It doesn't get absorbed by the skin. It doesn't suffocate your skin. So if you have sensitive skin, you could wear the makeup today where before you would have to go without because your skin would just be clogged up. And then also it's not as aging. It's not as drying. A lot of concealers and foundations and things would just dry on the skin and just make you look 10 times older, even though you were still in your 20s. Now makeup is about giving you that hydration, that beautiful all over youthful look without any of the nasties. There's no talcs. There's no oils, fragrance, fillers, chemical dyes. You want to avoid all of that in order to give you your best face. Achieving your best face sometimes requires an active approach toward exfoliation. One popular effective exfoliant is lactic acid. The role lactic acid plays is it's a component of NMF, the natural moisturizing factor that exists within the corneocytes of the skin. Um, quick definition, a corneocyte is a flat protein envelope. As you move down the skin, the lactic acid is in those corneocytes, helping to balance the water of it. Lactic acid helps by making the skin cells, that mortar and brick that I was talking about, a little less sticky. So it makes the glue that holds the skin cells together less sticky, and so those skin cells are able to gently exfoliate off without irritating the skin, and that can make the skin smoother. It also helps pull water into the skin, so at the same time it's helping to hydrate and moisturize the skin. In fact, lactic acid has been used for centuries, with evidence that it was used during the time of Queen Cleopatra. Lactic acid is an alpha hydroxy acid, so hydroxy acids are broken down into alpha hydroxy and beta hydroxy acids. And so alpha hydroxy acids include glycolic acid and lactic acid. Uh, the way that the hydroxy acids work is they compact the epidermis is, is the easiest way to explain it, is they form a nice seal over the epidermis, so the stratum corneum or the outer layer. Uh, there's also uh, some evidence that it may actually increase collagen, improve the ground substance or the um, matrix of the dermis, in other words, increase the production of what the collagen and elastic fibers sit in uh, within the dermis. Some chemical peels utilize the properties of lactic acid to aid in exfoliation, but chemical peels contain different active ingredients and have many different risks for their rewards. Peels differ in their mechanisms. Some of them are caustic, they're burny, they're your acids basically. Some of them are toxic, they introduce something lethal to the skin, they're not burning anymore, they're melting things down. You will get a much deeper burn as it melts down protein structures to get to a new surface, to get the skin to know something's wrong, make me some skin. However, the problem is the skin proliferates after inflammation and damage, but it doesn't achieve the level of collagen that normal skin has. So such skin may come back smooth, very smooth, because you've wiped the surface, there's nothing left of the surface. What you see at the top is new but it will not have thickness or elasticity, so it's extremely taut. Another common substance in skincare is glycolic acid. Glycolic acid works in a similar fashion, so these are both alpha hydroxy acids. Lactic acid is a little bit more gentle, and uh, glycolic acid can be stronger, which can make it more or less irritating to the skin. But the idea is similar in that it makes the skin cells less sticky and helps them exfoliate. Glycolic acid's interaction with the skin is a bit unnatural. First, because it doesn't occur in the skin. So there's no reason the skin should be like, yay, we got some glycolic. It's not familiar. Um, it's also an extremely potent acid. I don't think it's the right currency for acids, even though it's popular. Um, what it's doing is it's basically dissolving the top layer of the skin. And that is a desirable thing to do because the skin sheds constantly. And anything that helps the shedding process can, in the right amounts, help the skin turn over. Turnover signals the lower layers of the skin to turn over more skin. And this process uh, prevents the surface from looking dull and wrinkled. 
and also creates a healthier overall skin. With glycolic, you will get some side reactions. When you apply a moisturizer to the skin, what you're doing is ideally locking the water in the skin, into the skin, and helping prevent loss of water. And depending on what, what kind of moisturizer you're using, you may also help pull water from the environment into the skin as well. The best time to apply a moisturizer is right after a bath or shower, when your skin is already full of water. When you take a bath or shower and your fingers look pruney, they look that way because they're waterlogged. They have so much water in them that that's how they look. So if you apply a moisturizer then that's thick and rich and emollient, it's actually going to help lock that water into the skin and help keep your skin looking hydrated and smooth. Moisturizer has met makeup in the sense that we are now asking and wanting ingredients that are going to give us moisturization throughout the day. In the evening, our skin nourish, protects, repairs, and restore itself. But how many of us are getting eight hours of sleep these days? Not many. So we are in our makeup from 8, 10, 12, even longer throughout the day. And so we need a makeup that is actually going to incorporate our day skin regimen into our daily long wear, and that's where moisturizer and makeup meet. Shea butter is a great ingredient for this, and I know shea butter kind of freaks people out, especially if they have oily skin, because why would you want to put something that has an oily consistency on the skin if you already have oily skin? But with shea butter being a natural product, it nourishes the skin, it's micronized down, so it's the, the thinnest little film that goes to the skin, giving you great hydration, adhesibility, nourishment to the skin, but also makes your skin look its best. So this actually works as a moisturizer within your mineral makeup and gives you that extra little, little kick to your day skincare regimen. Moisturizer can help normal skin retain a healthy appearance. There's a common misconception that wrinkles are the result of a lack of moisture. Well, um, a wrinkle is made by collapse of collagen structures. So if the collagen is supposed to be aligned straight and uh, it cross-links because it's damaged and it doesn't build as nicely, um, or you're getting older and you can't pump it out as well, eventually it looks, the structure falls apart and starts ca collapsing. Now, there's so many reactions in the skin that could have gone wrong um, to get to that point, and then there's UV damage. So let's assume some of all of those happened, right? Okay, uh, some lack of cellular components, bad nutrition, UV damage, the skin starts, you know, not looking so good because you can't make or repair the collagen structure fast enough. So there it goes. Now what's the role of moisture after that's happened? Moisture can't do much about bad structural features. It just can't, there's no way. And, and that I think people know viscerally. That's why most people say creams don't work. I think creams do work today and they do something, but they may not do miracles, most of them, but they do something. But what they don't do is just put some moisture in a depleted structural element and fill it. That's the injection craze. As a result of the myth of moisture, many people may overuse moisturizers. This overuse can cause dull, dry skin as old cells become trapped on the epidermal layer. Further complicating matters are the economics of skincare product manufacturing. In order to deliver moisturizers to market affordably, many companies may use lower cost ingredients. Many people think that they have sensitive skin and they will say, oh, you know, I get red, I'm irritated, I'm, I'm peeling, I'm flaking. And they will say, I've got sensitive skin. But when you really talk to the client and you talk with them about their skin, what products they're using, a lot of times it's actually the products that are exacerbating the condition that they're trying to treat in the first place. Cost is a huge concern within the cosmeceutical industry and there's got to be a balance um, with creating a fantastic formula that's going to be effective, that's going to give the consumer what they want from a results standpoint, but also be reasonable from a manufacturing standpoint in, in cost. So ingredient cost is something that's at the forefront um, with all cosmeceutical companies. And you know, some 
choose ingredients wisely and they are the best of the best and those will generally be your, your higher price products. However, within our industry, you also have companies that um, make a very cheap formulation but put it in a really pretty package and that can be very deceiving to the consumer as well. What makes an effective moisturizer? You have to start with a good formulation and good ingredients. So there are lots of different ingredients we look for, like hyaluronic acid, shea butter, sometimes um, lactic acid can be used, and urea even. Um, these ingredients, some of them are humectants, glycerin can be in there. Some people may be more or less sensitive to some of these ingredients, so you'll have to pick and choose based on what works for you. But typically they help help keep the skin well hydrated, meaning holding water into the skin and locking the water in the skin there. And when you have water in the skin, that makes it look and feel more radiant, more vibrant, and more elastic. A main component in the formulation of skincare products and makeup is an emulsifier, which binds the oil and the water in a moisturizer together. They work in concert with emollients. When you're looking for a great makeup, you want to look for something that has more of an emollient compound because what the emollient compound does is that it actually hydrates the skin throughout the day. So you want something that's going to be a bit more hydrating. Emulsifiers are what we add into creams and things to hold their consistency together. So if you think about the separation of your products onto the skin, the emulsifiers are going to hold it together so that it, it contains its creamy substance. Emollients are going to give you that hydration. In great emollients, you can get them in natural form of shea butter and vitamin E. So these are going to give you not only great antioxidants into the skin, but they're also going to give you that extra hydration throughout the day. There are a variety of different emollients on the market, and most commonly you'll find water-soluble shea butter, which is a fantastic ingredient for formulations. Hyaluronic acid has been very popular over the years as well. So those are just a few of the, of the emollients that we would consider great for a skincare ingredient. I think the key is um, using them and I think using them on a, on a regular basis. I think what ends up happening is people start to use uh, emollients or moisturizers uh, for several days and then they stop and then they start. It's kind of like uh, exercising. You know, if you exercise kind of on a regular basis, you're gonna be a lot better off uh, than somebody who sporadically uh, does these things. So uh, I think a lot of these ingredients are, that, that are contained in most of these emollients and moisturizers are effective. I think a cream-based Moisturizer is very important and works better than lotion. Actually, in certain people, when a lotion is applied to dry skin, it actually does not trap moisture. It actually has a drying effect in some people. So the best time to apply emollients and apply moisturizers is after you come out of the shower. There are often many ingredients used to create skincare products, and sometimes there are chemicals used that are less than ideal. Some of the ingredients you might want to avoid when looking at different products are oils, petroleum oils, mineral oils, um, talcs, fragrance, added fragrance. These are things that are just common irritants to the skin. Also chemical dyes. Now there, we have come so far in makeup that we can get our color derived from natural minerals. We don't need chemical dyes in order to get great color. So you want to really avoid these because one, it can suffocate the skin, it can irritate the skin, it can inflame your skin. And so you just really want to be able to wear makeup that doesn't have these things, but you can still achieve the great coverage, great color, and skin benefits. Propylene glycol is a substance that's part of many, um, many compounds, many, um, it's used to create some kind of consistency in cosmeceuticals. Um, it's a little bit harmful, I would say. It's something one would want to remove. Um, it's used as a solvent, basically. Better products police against it. Parabens are something that get removed from the better products. Um, there are derivatives of the benzenes and aromatics that people don't like to have on their skin. Shea butter, a wonderful fat, perfectly resembles the skin. You take a block of shea butter, put it along your hand, it's gone. It's not greasy because it went somewhere, because the skin recognized it and let it in. 
Ingredients and formulations of modern skincare products are very similar in many ways to today's modern cosmetics as well. Makeup can actually act as an extension of skin care. Women wear makeup for a multitude of reasons. Um, I personally wear makeup because I feel like it really helps me to put my best foot forward. It really gives confidence to women if it's put on properly, if they learn and take the time to, to apply it properly. Well, I'm lucky to have celebrities that usually have great skin, but I have worked with real women at the counters and I have helped them with their concerns. So women should choose their makeup according to their skin type. Is it oily? Is it dry? Is it sensitive? And women should look for products that are multitasking, that will give you coverage, that will give you some protection, and that will nourish your skin. Makeup and skin care exist now together because we are really wanting all the benefits that we're getting from our skin care. We are looking for copper, we're looking for zinc, we're looking for vitamin E, we're looking for shea butter, we're looking for things that are going to give us anti-aging also in our cosmetics. Whether it be from our foundation, whether it be from our concealers, we're wanting anti-aging in our, our cosmetics as well as in our skincare. And in that way, they work together to really enhance what each one does. That's giving us hydration, that's giving us moisturization, that's giving nourishment to the skin so that that way our skin does what it's meant to do and that's nourish, protect, and restore itself. What you put on your skin is important, and choosing the right products for your type of skin can make the difference between looking healthy and appearing dull. How you apply those products, in the case of your makeup, can also make a big difference. Makeup artist Jackie Gomez explains her technique during this makeup session. So we're going to start moisturizing from the center of the skin. Actually, we want to be sure to moisturize our lips as well when we are applying our moisturizer. Just part of a routine that we should all do, just to hydrate our lips. So to create flawless skin, I'm going to add some foundation and some concealer to just even out the skin tone and make sure that she looks perfect. When applying foundation, you should start from the center of the face outwards, just to create a really flawless, natural look. Now we're gonna move into concealer. We're gonna conceal underneath her eyes. Concealer is really like an eraser. It's just gonna erase any dark circles or any sunspots or anything that you want to give it a little extra coverage. And we're going to go from the lash line. We're going to work our way all the way up to the brow bone with a light shadow, just to kind of give you a really beautiful soft lid. So now we're going to do the cat eye. You just want to get really, really close to your lash line. all the way to the inner corner. And once you're at the corner of your eye, you can really just pull out the tail. And make sure we grab every single lash and we're just gonna squeeze as tight as we can and just kind of pump the eyelash curler a little bit. We're just going to comb the brows out and just fill them in a little bit. And you could just use a brow comb just to brush them. When applying bronzer, be sure to apply it anywhere where the sun might kiss your, your skin, like your forehead, across your nose, around your cheekbones. So when applying blush, make sure you smile. You apply it right on the apples of the cheeks and in circular motions, just blend outwards. In that way, you don't have such a harsh blush on your face. And we're done. Not only does your makeup play a role in your overall appearance, but even what you put in your body, your nutrition,
can also play a large factor in skin care. Specifically, you want dark green leafy vegetables like spinach and kale and collards and Swiss chard because they have detoxification properties. They help assist the removal of toxins from the large intestine, which is really beneficial to the skin. You want things like cucumber. Like the one single vegetable that would be the best for your skin is a cucumber. Juice it, drink it, put it on your face. It's great for the puffiness under your eyes. It's great to clean out your um, kidneys and your adrenal glands. It reduces inflammation in the face. It's the most amazing thing. So get plenty of that in your diet. Get, like, so again, think of the rainbow, like dark green leafy vegetables, the red things, the carrots, red peppers, um, orange peppers, radishes, all different types of vegetables that you can actually get into your diet, fit into your diet. And if you can eat them in their raw state, like in a salad, all the better. And you get more vitamins, more minerals, more enzymes that help with cellular repair and are great antioxidants. My experience has been that when I ask my patients about their skin or when I see that their skin improves over time from either better skin care or treatments that we do, they make other better choices in their lives. Often they end up losing weight if they need to or having a healthier diet or a better lifestyle. So feeling good about how you look really does help you make better decisions in your life. But it's not just following a good diet and monitoring the content of a product that makes for the best skin care regimen. There's a real science behind what works and what doesn't, and it's called chirality. The chirality, or handedness, of molecules has been studied since the days of Louis Pasteur. In 1848, he first noticed that there were differences between molecules of the same compound while he was conducting experiments on wine fermentation for the French wine industry. But chiral compounds are not just present in wine, as Pasteur found. Chiral compounds are part of the biochemical processes in the human body. Chirality means um, mirror image. So most of us are symmetric, fairly symmetric, and you could draw a line down the middle of our body and sort of fold it over, if you imagine, and that would be mirror images. On a molecular level, some of our major components have mirror images. Hands are great examples of mirror image, and the term chirality means hand in Greek. And we talk about handedness in chemistry when we talk about two molecules that have the same component parts but are mirror images of each other. So chirality is at its base a spatial relationship. It's not a chemical relationship because the two chiral things have exactly the same molecular weight, exactly the same number of atoms and types of atoms. So they are chemically identical and we call them isomer, meaning equal parts, but they are spatially different. Now, what does this all mean? Well, if the body has developed to use one-handedness of something, then that means the body has a receptor that it's complementary. Now, if I came into a receptor that's, that's left-handed with my own left hand, I would not be able to make that fit. So the basic idea behind chirality in the body is We've evolved with this notion that some versions of molecules work and others do not. And it's important to use the one that works. Let's say you 